What's happening? It's Sir William, and today I'm at the Action Tracks headquarters here in Wichita, Kansas. We're going to learn all about traction boards, what goes into making a good traction board, and how they differ from regular old plain pieces of plastic. Let's roll. What's up, man? Hey, good to see you, brother. Good to see Glad you, you came too. by the shop, man. Yeah, man. I appreciate you having me. This is a uh, this is quite the operation that you have here. Well, thank you. You know, uh, you and I have met out on the East Coast. We've met uh, out, out west. We've met down south. And uh, I always tell people when they come through the Midwest, if you come through, please come by. We're happy to uh, uh, provide a soft landing spot for travelers on the road. We, yeah, can't, we well, love our customers. That you have done, and I really appreciate it. I wanted to take these guys, man, and I wanted to show them how to make hey, the guys, world's gals. best traction board. Okay. Because I honestly think that you have the world's best traction board here. Thank and you. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to kind of go throughout the entire history of action tracks. I don't think that everybody understands quite what's involved in this entire operation that you have. So I wanted to uh, to get you on camera and, and we shed some light and show these folks what all is involved from the very beginning. Takes us through uh, through the start all the way up till now. Well, uh, we were, as a lot of people know, we were out on the road. We were desert mechanics doing desert racing. That was always our dream. I was a, an airplane mechanic here back in Wichita, Kansas. I, I think we drove by the uh, Learjet, Learjet yeah. and the Cessna yeah. plant. And there's a lot of great uh, high-tech industry right here in Wichita, Kansas. Yeah. About 70% of the pl well, world's planes are actually made here. But that's where it started. I was watching a movie called Dust to Glory. We laugh. We call it the Devil's Recruiting Film. We ended up parking cars in uh, race car parking lots, working up to course workers, working up to getting on uh, uh, working for pit crew companies like Baja Pits and then eventually on to some Midwestern race teams as mechanics and eventually so racing. You guys were out there. Yeah, we were out there living on the road, living in an RV with little kids. Uh, wow. Uh, you know, f trying to make 50 bucks so we get some gas and get to the next town. Along the way, we started selling gear. We started specializing in recovery boards, okay. which a lot of people had never seen. But what they didn't know was that recovery boards are actually about a 100-year-old United States invention, actually a little older than 100 years. For anybody that thinks that any of this stuff was invented in Australia or they were the original, this uh, is going to be a big wake-up call for you. So all these ideas have basically been one evolution, a better mousetrap, a better version, a better material, a better improved design. Since the very first guy that made these, the first patented example we have of a recovery track is in 1912. The joke goes that the recovery board was probably invented about five minutes after the after wheel. After the wheel. <laughs> yeah. So we started selling other people's recovery boards out off of our back bumper. People laughed at us. People told us they didn't get stuck. They didn't need that. It was only $15 worth of plastic BBs. On and on and on. But we had used them uh, ourselves initially. As, I mean, we knew that recovery boards worked and that they were a valuable tool if you were going to be off the pavement out there in sand, snow, mud, muck, mud, rock, you name it. Um, so uh, at, there came a juncture where we wanted to make an American-made recovery board. And we wanted to take what we had learned in the field, make improvements, and become for better or worse masters of our own destiny so it started with a napkin we drew up what we wanted to do and and what our ideas were and how we'd like to treat our customer how we'd like to do business with vendors where we'd like to be manufacturing how we'd like to be shipping our idea of uh, a long distance haul is driving an hour and a half away to visit one of our uh, suppliers. Most of our stuff is made within a hundred miles of here. Um, some of the raw materials, like the raw materials that DuPont R&D makes for us, are made in South Carolina. Uh, so it, stuff comes from all of the United States, but the idea being keep it all in the U.S. Um, and we didn't really, we knew it was a good policy. We didn't know it was going to show how good of a policy it was so fast when we started this. We started these four years ago, okay. 2017. We branched off on our own, and for about, the, we thought it was going to take X amount of dollars and six months. Well, it ended up taking about 4X and about two years. That's the crazy part to me, and that's what I don't think none of these guys understand, is exactly what all is involved, and I'd like to dig down into that. So, you design this thing onto a napkin, right? right? which seems simple enough, and then you say, okay, well, 
let's find somebody to make this thing for me. Right. And just that process alone just is, the very a first step. A, is a little bit of a hurdle, right? The very first problem we ran into was I, I drew out my designs and I went and I showed it to a tool maker uh, and they said, they looked at my paper and they said, what's that? Where's your CAD, where's your CAD file? And I went, CAD file? And I kind of knew what that was. I said, but I don't, I don't do that. And I said, well, come back when you do. And I went to the next guy and he said, where's your CAD file? And I went to the guy to make a uh, box and he said, where's your CAD file? And all. So I realized I had to get a CAD file. And that's when, that was the first really big hurdle. Yeah. Um, I had no experience with CAD, very little experience with product design other than just dreaming up things. So at the end of the day, me and a kid in college, I found out the local maker, which ICT maker bought, okay. uh, which is a $25 a month club that allows you to have access which to is really cool, by 3D the way. printing yeah. and welders and things like that. And uh, I found a guy there, and um, for a couple hundred bucks, me and him sat there for a couple weeks um, with different recovery boards and tape measures and rulers and micrometers, just playing around, uh, virtually stacking them, virtually uh, trying to make interchangeable teeth. Um, and it was a whole process that I really knew nothing about. Um, what I really had, so from there, now I had this CAD file and I had, you know, thousand dollars of my own money wrapped up in this thing things are getting serious now because yeah. no one even believed me until i had this cad file i couldn't even go out and price anything once i had a cad file we started shopping around and found out that there were a whole host of new problems um and the first one being you're not actually trying to design a product as much as you're trying to design the machinery and the tooling to make this product Yes. So after we'd made this, we had to go uh, design a much more expensive and involved uh, CAD design for some basic tooling, which is essentially a reverse of this with things like coefficient of expansion and, and different aspects of heating ratios, cooling temperatures. There's a lot of vents in this. There has to be a ton of vents because when you pack that much material into a space that fast, it wants to heat up and explode any air. All kinds of things are going on in here as so we actually mold. What he means by tooling, just so we're clear, is this massive piece that you see on the screen right here. And it's, uh, what is it, 14,000 pounds. That's after a bunch of chunks have been taken off. Yep. Now, you had $1,000 wrapped up in your money. Now you got to find somebody to take a massive, totally not uh, cheap yep. piece of metal, then do a couple, what, thousand more dollars worth of million thousands tens and tens, tens and tens, and tens of, of, of yes you get up into the hundreds <laughs> of thousands real quick the raw steel to build the tool was sixty thousand dollars for the block of tool steel which was about as big as if this was square it's about a, a cubic yard a little over that's what we saw there at, uh, yeah. at the factory and then we found a then comes the next question who are you going to entrust with to make your tool, to make your tool? Are you going to send your CAD file off to Taiwan to save 20 or 30%? Are you going to go for the lowest bidder? Are you going to find a, an American tool shop and be willing to maybe wait for them? Because one of the things we found was that with the exodus of manufacturing that's happened over the last couple of decades here in America, the manufacturers and the tool shops that are still in America are extremely busy. Yeah. They are full um, because they have kept on catering to the a customer and industry that demands quality over price. Uh, we quickly saw as we evaluated prices and now so more than even a few years ago, we saw that by the time you ship it and you account for problems and the fact that you can't even uh, go visit any of your uh, people, that the savings was nowhere near good enough to even justify looking at it, and, which we knew we didn't want to anyways. But right, we did right. investigate all options when we uh did this you, you'd be silly not to and not only are they busy and uh with a plethora of people that want to make something the last thing they want to deal with is some dude that dreamed up a plastic board on a piece of napkin that he thinks he's going to shove up underneath the tires of that has very small no money people he wants to come in and make <laughs> 50 
copies of it <laughs> yeah. on a tool that's uh, yeah. on an assembly on a machine line that's made to produce 50,000 yeah. and not even hiccup. So um, you get the tool. Right? Now comes the sauce on the pizza, right? And the sauce on the pizza is trying to find what we want to make this out of because we know we've seen demonstrations that plastic doesn't work. Right. Right. We, we thought it was going to be as simple as calling up uh, some local polymer suppliers, telling them about what we needed. We knew generally that we wanted to try to make it out of nylon six, and we thought uh, that would be that. Well, uh, as we had depleted the very last of our funds, uh, had our mortgage house for the second time, we we're facing bankruptcy on about our tenth different try of raw materials, and they'll give you some for free, but there were there were always unexpected consequences and issues whether it be when the temperatures got cold, whether it be when you added the colors, because every color is technically a contaminant. Um, there were unexpected issues that we didn't have the R&D budget to absorb. So uh, really in our darkest hour, and that was a huge problem that, um, that we faced, was now that we have this tooling, uh, the material science aspect of it. Let me put it this way. We may have been a bit ambitious when we set out to build the world's strongest, toughest polymer board, yeah. having zero experience. Yeah. But what kept us going, and the only reason we have succeeded, is because in our minds, we knew what that board had to do. We knew what kind of abuse our customers were gonna put it through. We knew from other materials and other boards that it was possible to get close to that. And that's what kept us going. And wouldn't allow us to settle for anything other than the, than the best. And I told KC the other day when we were talking about all this, because I've been hanging out here for you uh, throughout this whole process, just to really get an in-depth detail and feel of what Action Tracks is as an entire company. And one of the things that I said after I realized everything that he's done over the past few years to put Action Tracks where they are right now is, it takes an absolute crazy man to do this. Anybody in their right mind would, they would have given as soon as they would have as soon as they would have found out hey look it's going to take a couple hundred thousand dollars just to just to get the machine or just to get the tool to go into the machine to make what you need to do no guarantees and no guarantees you're going to have to go out and give away big chunks of this com company yeah. you're going to have to go beholden to other people we had angel partners that helped us i want to give a shout out to John Bradshaw in Twin Mountain Off-Road Park in West Virginia that he was an early guiding angel that told me, you don't need an investor, you need a plan. Yeah. And him and his father helped me see the light of how we were going to actually uh, take this forward with some action steps early, early on. So I owe him an everlasting debt of gratitude. Um, but from there, we were forced to take on some unsavory partners that tried to steal everything from us, tried to hedge us out. Um, a lot of things have happened. But <clears throat> through a lot of hard work, proving that it could work and being the only one that could fix it and the only one that could sell it and the only one that was willing to go coast to coast to coast and deliver these to people even when with they... With them on your back. Yeah. With Literally. <laughs> the first time we met, I was carrying some on my back through the mud. Hey, everybody. My name's Casey. We're desert racers. We love overlanding. We love camp. We love getting muddy. We love getting off the track. And these are our America-made, 100% U.S. America-made action tracks. Available at usactiontracks.com. They're twice as durable. 100% American made and less expensive to the customer. So get some if you're going to get stuck. Those customers have made the difference for us. If, if it wasn't for you customers out there um, playing along with us, allowing to understand that we're just a small mom and pop company trying to make something incredible, without your customers, we wouldn't be here. So we yeah. thank you. Now it's 2021. Right. We've got this thing. I don't want to call it dialed in, right? It's, right. We're still tweaking, yeah. As far as the board goes, we've got the board dialed in. We've got a, a, a special type of construction. Tell us a little bit, of, without going into extreme detail, about the sauce on the pizza here. Sure. What is the board made out of? Sure. Well, and that really is a, a, the million-dollar question. And yeah. It's a trade secret that I can't come okay. right out and tell you, but I will tell you that... The Chinese boards and the cheap boards are made out of uh, polypropylene. Some have some ABS and PVC mixed in there. Some have uh, some fiberglass, shortcut fiberglass in there, some don't. That runs you about, keep in mind prices are all over the place nowadays, but let's say 60 to 80 cents a pound. 
Um, then you move to a nylon six, a nice virgin grade nylon six. Super tough modified, as they say, which is what your uh, higher end Australian recovery tracks are made of. That runs you about $2.50, $3 a pound by the time you get dyes and colors in it and everything. Our material is only used in two other applications around the world, and we were chosen by DuPont, our, uh, Transport R&D, as a test platform because of the insane abuse that our customers dish out on this. I said, I'm going to make a quarter-inch board that's going to hold monster trucks up, and the weighted uh, uh, mining and forestry trucks are going to use and spin their 1,000 horsepower's worth of tires against. And everyone looked at me like I was crazy. I said, the we can do it. Yeah, across yeah. the world, yeah. Uh, up, up armored vehicles yeah. in sub-freezing temperatures. And du the one scientist at DuPont R&D reached out to me and said, I think I got the answer for you. And we started a relationship, thank you, Carl, and they come down uh, on a regular basis and help dial and tweak in our molding and stuff. Now, this is approximately uh, prototype number 19, material-wise. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, since we have our, uh, by the time we got to about 17 or 18, they were working really well except for in sub-freezing temperatures and with certain dyes, which, like I said, each dye is a series of pigments that are essentially contaminated. Most of these materials don't, per se, have a bell curve okay. on performance. It's more of a drop-off, and that point occurs around freezing. Okay. Uh, especially for the nylons and such. Okay. These, we, ha you, we have tested these and used these with zero problems. Uh, I personally use them down to about negative 17, negative 20 degrees, which is nasty, nasty stuff. I'm not wanting to get out of anything yeah. lower than yeah. that. <laughs> this material here, even though we have factory support, still costs about $5 a pound. Double what the, the, the leading... Double what uh, the leading wow. people pay. I can make this material soft and flexible. I can make it hard. It, that's a tra that gives you a trade-off between performance and sharp rocks right. and cold temperatures. The more brittle it is, the less performance you get in sharp rocks. So this is where we've come to that we feel good about. In the last 18 months that we have been using this compound, this particular modification of our compound, we've had zero, we're very proud to say, zero warranties for breakage. Um, we are, uh, we have had some small issues with the orange dye uh, fading. So if anyone out there has orange tracks that are in the sun all the time and they're noticing they're starting to fade, we are working on that. So Now, when carbon. we talk about it fading, that doesn't mean that it's losing its strength. It's just not looking pretty sitting up on top of your roof rack anymore, but it's still got the same strength. Right. We actually just got back uh, results from the Department of Defense Naval, Naval Materials Lab, which is located in Key West, Florida, where they strapped these to a fence in the surf for a year. And uh, wow. while they did fade, had zero embrittlement, zero wow. degradation is what they rated them as. Zero well, degradation. I keep mine on my roof, and I've folded these things in half. I've put them under dual wheels. I put them yeah. through stuff that they probably shouldn't have to. So I, I feel sure that they'll they'll hold up. And the orange is the only color we've That's been That's the only one? Yeah. Well, so congratulations, and we're working by on the way, right on no warranty claims in a full year thank yeah, you yeah congratulations you. on that now take us through your warranty because that's pretty significant yeah our warranty is uh five years no questions asked any breakage we'll send you another pair free shipping if you burn the teeth off that's normal wear and tear but ours are designed with center punched holes in the back and appropriately sized openings for a quarter inch washer so you can literally, with a quarter inch drill bit and a couple pieces of hardware off your local hardware store shelf, add your own teeth back in. And I'll put a link to a video where we do just that on a, uh, on a set of traction yeah. boards. Here. We're going to repair a pair of yours while you're here. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. I, I told him, I said, inevitably, whenever you get uh, any kind of recovery gear, you find out that you use it more for other people than you mm. do yourself, yeah. which is a good problem to have. The only issue is when you tell people no tire spin and they're in a panic situation, the first thing that they do is they just gun it out of here. We call it the action tracks curse. If you own a pair and you put them on your truck, you probably won't need them yeah. unless to help somebody else. Yeah. If you own a pair and you take them off your vehicle and you go out, you need them immediately. you're going to need them immediately. <laughs> so... If you've got them, keep them with you because you'll need them when you least expect it. Now, you make a couple different styles of boards. Let's talk about the different styles of boards. Cause there's about three of them, right, that sure, you make? Sure, sure. We have two standard styles and one kind of uh, unique special order style. 
Uh, a standard style is just all polymer teeth. That's the least expensive model. Comes in at uh, 269 retail. We designed ours to be a little less expensive than uh, the Australian imports, even though our raw material costs cost twice as much. And you say, how is that possible? Well, we operate on a thinner margin and we pass more of the value back to the customer. If I sold these at the same profit margin that the other companies do, it'd be a five or $600 pair of tracks. Um, I give most of it back to the customer. Then we have what we call our standard metal upgrade. We have the ability in our molding process to actually replace these 36 individual inserts, 18 on each end, uh, with, a, with a molding insert that just leaves a hole uh, so we don't have to drill them out like we're gonna do on yours in a little while. And so this, because these are the areas that grab with the tire and these are the areas that wear off first. So this is our standard metal upgrade. It's got 72 uh, nuts, bolts, and uh, 144 washers in it. And it costs about a $75 upgrade. You pay us about a dollar a bolt to put them in, which uh, is, if after you do it yourself and you buy the hardware, you realize, hey, that's not a bad deal. We could ask these guys. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and say, Where does that money go? Well, here's some of it supporting uh, some of our helpers here. Yeah. So uh, we're a small company, husband and wife owned. We have about four part-time employees. Man, I'm telling you here after the week, I've, I've, I've been through the trenches with you here. Right. Um, we've gone from, from start to finish, right? So customer comes on, they order something online. It goes to Melissa, your goes wife. Melissa, you process the payment, get the yeah. shipping paperwork done, get it to uh, us. Yeah. Then we drive over here. Yeah. Pack them up. Yeah. I helped them do some boxing yeah. over there. And that's before, you know, of course, going to the That's factory. once these are made. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. So we, we get to the factory, and we saw these things being made, and right? that's a process in itself. Yeah. We you saw know. a large team out there. Uh, a lar we have a lot of great partners that yeah. help us pull us off, all in America and operating to the highest exacting standards. Yeah. You know, somebody, it's easy for somebody to come up to you at a show, say, ah, you know, $15, $20 worth of BBs, and we can melt this thing down and make it. It just yeah. doesn't work that way. I'm just going to throw it out there. This is $100 worth of BBs per pair. That's at today's prices. The only other place you'll find this material used is in a few advanced pieces of medical equipment and the train car coupling bushings uh, on new modern cars are starting to use this. Uh, you know when you hear the cars link up yeah. and you hear it clink with a few million pounds down the track? This is the material they're going to to absorb that. Well, tell us a little bit of the difference between uh, your board and, say, some of the other competitors. Obviously, it's the sauce, the pizza sauce, but sure. there's a few other key design differences, too. Take us through those. Sure. The first one, and one of the most simple ones we noticed, was that most of the boards out there are really hard to dig with. And that's a fairly important part of the job, unless you happen to have a folding uh, a trench shovel on you or a long even better a long handled shovel on your rig or one of those crazy beaver tools i like those those shovels yeah. are cool uh so you can send me one crazy beaver i'll crazy trade you beaver. um but so ours have large uh, hand holds on them. people in america are big we eat a lot and it snows here and it's cold and it's muddy and it's rocky and we wear gloves so if you're anything like me, I don't even have huge hands. I just have normal sized hands. If you got a wedding ring on, it becomes a real issue to grab this thing and work with any of these tools. You've got some footage of me showing that you can't even fit your hands in yeah. a lot of them. Even the Aussie ones, you can't get your whole hand there with a yeah. glove very good. Now, we also found that when it comes to digging, vehicles are normally sunk in down to hopefully not the frame, but many times they are, and they're always sunk in a little bit with the tires. So there's very little vertical room to actually be digging, digging per se. So what you end up doing is more sort of moving material out of the sawing. way. Yeah, sawing. Yeah. So I thought, hey, why not put a sawtooth end on there, and then I can literally just get in there where it's almost flat, it only has to be a few inches of clearance, and I can saw a little slot and then slide this in because I only need a hole that's as big as a slot. Yeah. And I thought, wow, I wonder if that'd work. And it works great. Turns out, yeah. it does. It's also good for self-defense. Yeah, it's nasty. <laughs> Another thing that uh, always amazed me was we used to make repair kits for other tracks. And I machined custom teeth. I had a wide variety of little shapes that we would make. All play and see what would be better. 
Here they are. Aluminum. Cost me two and a half bucks a piece to make in volume. I still got to make a living. All of a sudden, you start putting stuff like this on your board, you got a five or six hundred dollar pair yeah. of tracks real quick. Yeah. So, for the Green Berets and trophy truck drivers down in Baja, I started just uh, experiment with putting nuts and bolts on there. I thought people would think it was kind of stupid. We were just trying to save money. We're dirtbag desert racers. Turns out they worked better than any tooth I could make. They cost 50 cents a setup. A whole lot better. And I could mod someone's entire boards for a hundred dollar bill or something. Yeah. And they were thrilled. The metal, not only does it, it does two things. One, it doesn't wear off. Okay. Two, it grabs the rubber of the tread better, like Velcro. And it's this initial grab that is so important. The only thing with the metal is, it now moves the failure points in the contact to the tire. So you don't want to sit there and roast your tires until white smoke comes it's off of them. Done. Or else it'll sight cut them. Yeah. I've done destructive testing, and if you really, really want to and have a few minutes to kill burning rubber, you can blow a tire with these. Yeah. But I've never had anyone in real life um, in a situation where they're yeah, not doing I, abuse. I did to it. that yeah. on my own with old tires to see if and that, like I said, I was burning white smoke off of them for a solid minute. This should be depressed in. If you can, you want to load it in there with pressure. Uh, you can even load it in, and if you can, hook one of these edges up under your front bumper or something. Imagine that. If you can get this to your front tire and hook this up on your bull bar or something, it will press and preload that in. Then as you drive off it, it'll release and pop right down. So That's one of the benefits of it being as flexible as it is, too. Yeah. The flexibility helps in a lot of ways. It, um, you'll, you'll find that the one thing that you might give up a tiny bit with, with on the action tracks is bridging a truly open gap. You can double stack them to build increased strength. You can put a few rocks under it to give it some stability in the middle. But from personal experience, bridging is the least used of the capabilities. What happens a whole lot more is this thing is jammed in on a tire. It's banging, it's, it's now hooked up on a quarter panel or a rocker panel or something. It's trying to pull pieces of the car loose because you just really need to bend that corner down yeah. and get it away as the vehicle starts to uh, uh, get up on them. Take us through the process of actually using the boards. We'll throw up some video here of when we went to... Uh, when we went to the little Sahara ah, uh, that's right. sand dunes. That's right. Take us through the process. So I'm stuck now. I've got in. And uh, one thing that I'll lead off with is, a, is something that you guys can take away that I've learned from experience is as soon as you are stuck, as soon as, don't try to get out, but as soon as you are stuck, deploy all of your recovery gear right away. That's right. Uh, you can make life so much easier so on much yourself. Easier. If the first time the wheels spin... <laughs> Maybe give it a little reverse to see if you're going to go yep. back. But the instant you realize that wheels are turning, vehicle is not moving, stop. Immediately. Immediately. Next thing is immediately go walk around your vehicle, make sure there's no, nothing stupid, big rock in front of a tire, chalk it, and look at your wheels, air down. That's going to be your best friend, no matter what yep. you're doing, where you're at, if you're stuck air down you might be surprised you might drive right out of it sometimes you got to go a little lower than 10 psi too. yeah it's uh it, I, sticky situations right it, uh, depends on what situation demands <laughs> i always go for about a th I, I use a lot of times i don't have a valve uh, i don't have any kind of release tool or anything okay so i'll count 30 seconds 30 yeah. to 45 seconds yep. per tire i look for a nice i look for the sidewall to go pregnant on me okay. nice sag in the sidewall and then i stop and give it a try there so this is the point where if you have recovery tracks, this is going to be your best friend. You might not even have to air down. You can get it depending on the situation. If you're going to be pulling right back on the road and you want to try it with airing down, without airing down, <clears throat> that's a realistic scenario. But uh, if you're out in the woods, you probably needed to air down anyways. So go ahead and air down. One thing about airing down that's kind of neat is if you slide this under your tire before you air down, it will collapse on top of it, mm -hmm. which gives you a nice little added bit of traction this is a game of inches so one way or another you got the tires aired down you've looked under the car made sure you can see at least a sliver of daylight everywhere because if you're high centered you're going to have problems we've aired down we've made sure that we don't have any obstructions or anything like that yeah. ideally we've put this underneath the tire to air down on right we've we wanted, stopped yeah. before we went reverse back forth 25 times and now we're right. touching the frame at all points 
So, which brings us to, you want to be able to look under the car and see at least a paper thin crack of daylight everywhere. You don't want your differential hung up on something. Okay. You don't want your uh, uh, front diff or transfer case pushing through the door. All right. those things, you're going to want to get in there and clear some material out. And you can do that with the end of this. Um, so that's going to become real important. Then, like I said, just go ahead and put the recovery board under the tire. Uh, if possible, air down onto it. Sometimes you'll notice that when you do the little wiggle back and forth, if you wiggle to the front or the back and hit the brakes hard, if you're alone and hit the parking brake, that'll a lot of times give you just an inch gap on either side, and that'll the give you a little roll back. Yeah, just get. a little. Yeah. You weren't spinning your tires; you were just wiggling. Yep. Um, so you do all those things. You clear out some material. You do all that to give yourself the best possible advantage. Then. Go put it in low, slowly accelerate. It's not unusual for it to skip a little as it's grabbing. Skip, 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 that's fine. It's when it doesn't grab at all, when it goes that you're having problems. Reset. You're burning yeah. teeth and Reset. you're not going anywhere. And yeah, so if that happens, you'll wanna try to put them on the other side of the tire, some different tires. Sometimes even the front tires on a car that's not front wheel drive. Uh, will actually make the difference. You have to play around with it a little bit. If none of those are working and the chips are down and you're starting to get frustrated, go get your spare tire jack. Put one of these down in the mud. Doesn't matter what you're on, mud, rock, nastiness. Put your spare tire jack right in the middle. Get it off to one side. Barely slide it under there. Dig a hole, whatever you got to do. And get one, get, try to get the most stuck wheel up and out of the muck just that much so you can get this board really in there and that should do it if that doesn't if all that doesn't do it you've found yourself in that one in ten problems where you need uh assistance you, you need some kind of other assistance yeah, you're whether gonna it need, be a winch a buddy yeah. or something yeah uh, come the along. whole idea though is to get this guy as much underneath the tire yeah. to get just a little bit of grip yeah. to get you out of that hole and keep you moving. Yep. This will solve your problem about 90 per or more percent of the time if you follow the simple first instruction we gave, which was as soon as you get stuck, stop right there and get out and evaluate the situation. Awesome. Don't dig yourself in. Air your tires down. Put your recovery boards down. See what happens. You're probably going to be just fine. Yeah. Um, oh, one other thing I wanted to mention real quick is a lot of times ask me, people ask me, hey, are you going to come out with a small size version? Do you have a mini version for my UTV? Just that and the other. And I tell them that by my way of thinking and my experience, this is all based on momentum. This is about, we're, we're desert race car drivers. We race in two-wheel drive cars through terrain that people can't believe we race two-wheel cars through. How? Why? Because we never slow down. We keep up high speeds. Momentum is your friend. So this track will give most tires the ability to make most of one revolution. If your tire does not have enough space to make a full revolution, you cannot get enough momentum built up to get out of to where you're out. at. Yeah. So if you've got a track this long, as soon as you get up on it, you're back off of it. Yeah. Now, uh, people also ask me, hey, well, what do you think about this Chinese version? Hey, what about, uh, you know, the time I used my grandpa's funeral suit as a, and put it under the tire. Floor mats. Yeah, what about floor mats and chain link? <laughs> and I tell them, all, it's all great, especially yeah. if, if that's what you got, yeah. it's great. But if you, want, if you make a living or a hobby or a business out of being off the pavement, I recommend a tool like Action Tracks. The right tool can make the world of difference in many different cases. Being stuck in the middle of nothing in the mud and the muck and the sand is one that you're going to want to have the right tool. You're definitely making the right tool here. Tell us what's uh, what's coming up in the future for Action Tracks. Anything uh, that we need to be on the lookout? Uh, things coming up in the future for Action Tracks are uh, uh, we're redesigning our orange dye to okay. work on uh, some UV fade problems we've had. Not material degradation, just simply color because a lot of the colors don't exist. We're working on a bright green kind of a, uh, okay. a monster Kawasaki Sweet. energy green because we all that's my personal favorite color. Yeah, bright green. We're and we're looking at um, 
possibly starting to distribute some products uh, made out of South Africa by a trucking company that services those triple trailer overland truckers you've seen going across Africa where they got like a cabin boy up front cooking on an open fire and they're stuck at the Nigerian yeah. border for like two weeks. Yeah, those guys. They have yeah. some pretty tough gear they need out there too. You got any of it here? Yeah, I do. You want to take a look at it? Show and tell, baby. All right, Show and tell. Let's go take a look. We got a bunch of stuff. Yeah, we got some interesting stuff. All right, let's see um, what we have. So this we like to play a little game with and, and ask people, gee, what do you think this is? Uh, it folds open. It's got an hinge in the middle. It rolls out like that. It's honeycomb. So it's obviously a whole uh, structure. Okay. Any ideas? Leave a comment down below if you're at this point and you have an idea of what this is. We'll wait uh, five seconds and go over your box. Okay. Then we'll and come then we'll back, back to that. that. These, hey, let's jump to these real quick. Okay. Yeah. Kind of neat. These are, these go on semi lug nuts, semi wheel lug nuts, or any large vehicle lug nuts. And if you can point them at 12 o'clock or 6, whatever, as long as they were standardized. And then if that moves, you know that your bolt has lost torque. These are torque indicators. Which is the last thing you want. The on, last uh, thing you want. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. And you'll notice, here's a nice uh, uh, kind of a standardized cargo crate, okay? Uh, you'll notice down here, one of my favorite features is it has this locking, a yeah. locking base yeah, they plate. Slide in. Here, lift it up and show the okay. to the viewers. So you could mount that on your roof or whatever, and then this drops back in. And let's see if it's as easy oh, to yeah. put that together. Oh, I got mine in, I think. There we go. Okay, that was pretty easy. That wasn't bad. Nothing a lot too, easier than nothing uh, too uh, earlier with geniuses. with it. Heavy duty locking mechanism on this bad boy, too. Heavy duty T handles. Open her up. Yeah, nice solid locking. case. Has pretty good capacity. Here are some uh, load guards for pallets or large okay. loads, so your heavy duty straps can go around it and not damage the material. Okay. Look at these. Look at this cute little product here. Ah. Wheel chocks in a nice little carrier. For your uh, any kind of trailer, really, yeah. but RVs and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. These are a beautiful size for small trailers. Yeah. Now, uh, right over there behind your wheel is the larger version. Let me get them. Because I imagine anything that's using that uh, lug nut uh, mm -hmm. deal that you showed, they're going to be using something like yeah. this. And what do you think of that? I mean, that's a nice chalk. That's, a, that's a nice chalk. That's a nice chalk. The material. So now let's go back to your piece down here. What this is is this is called a chain em up. This goes, but you'll notice there's two gradual humps right there that perfectly hold a semi tractor or trailer for a trundle of wheels. Okay. This goes right in, not the under the dually, okay. but right in between the dudes. So as you pull up onto it and get to this point where you feel a little bump so you know you're there, all four of your dually wheels are now approximately two inches off the ground. You can walk around with your snow and ice chains, slide them under, click, slide them under, click. It allows you to chain them up with ice chains in a matter of minutes. Now okay. what's the current process? What do they have huh. to do? Pure process goes something like this. You see the lights flashing on the highway and you're in your semi truck in I-70 and it's snowing and it's icy and you're pretty miserable yeah. and it's about 10 degrees out. And you pull over in the chain them up area and everyone else, everyone's running around in circles and you take your chains and you spread them out and try to get them all laying out there. And then you go run to the cab and you drive on and you come back and you hope that none of them moved or wiggled around or got too nasty and now they're all ice cold too by the sure, way. Sure, sure. And your hands are wet. Yeah. And you're out there and you're trying to buckle it here and you're trying to reach back in and buckle it there and these two fit and this one's short and this one got kicked out. So it's kind of like hooking up a trailer by yourself. Yeah. Where it's a matter of running back and forth, check and run back and forth, check. While being in sub freezing yes. temperature. Yeah. So these aren't uh, expensive. They're under $100 a piece. And if you're in the commercial trucking business and you travel in areas where there are snow chain requirements or it's just good policy, this might be a valuable tool for you. Yeah, so absolutely. It's a niche market, but for commercial trucking in ice and snow, it's a very legitimate uh, tool. Yeah. It saves time, energy, speed, and makes you work more efficient. Yeah, one of the things, uh, this nice toolbox. That, uh, okay. It makes it well. These are um, just 
nice, solid, heavy duty, manual boxes, at an affordable price range. I don't have all the prices yet, we're working on that, but uh, these are going to be uh, somewhere between the price of stuff you get at Walmart and the price of a high end, you know, a, a Luma case, or one of the, you know, one of the really nice It's good range. Yes, yes. <laughs> and so it's it's going to be a nice middle price range. Yeah. It's still, I mean, it's all very soft. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I really like the base plate system on this guy here. Yeah. Well, cool, man. So. Well, KC, brother, I'm excited for Action Tracks, where you guys are. The boards you guys make are just absolutely phenomenal. Seeing the whole operation here has really gave me an in-depth look at what it takes uh, to be a mom and pop business. Right. And the dedication you guys have behind it. Cool new products coming out. All of it, man. Thanks good for job. coming down, Will. We yeah, really appreciate you. Job. Where can they find you at? You can find us at uh, www.usactiontracks. That's T R A X. www.usactiontracks.com. You can find us on uh, Instagram at KC underscore Action Tracks. You can find us on Facebook. Uh, you can call us at 316 213 2482. We actually answer our phone. A variety of dealers around the country at some of the best off road shops coast to coast in the country. Awesome. And if your local off-road shop doesn't already carry Action Tracks, perhaps they carry some of the other competitors that are less quality, let them know they need to start carrying Action Tracks. Tell them to reach out. We'd love to hear from them and you. All right, guys. Appreciate you guys watching. Make sure that you hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, ring the bell for notifications. And until next time, peace. Thanks, everybody. See you, Will.